And good afternoon. This is the Barry Richards Show, but I'm Chris McCarthy. Barry has the day off. I'm filling in for him. Um, and uh, really excited to have this opportunity to once again bring Maureen Boyle to the, to the radio here for you folks. I had her on my show on Sunday a couple of months ago. Yes, uh, in September, I think. Yeah, and then, of course, you were on with Jim Phillips as well for his And you and I did, did something in Boston as well. Um, but this is a, just a, a incredible book. I've read it twice. It's called Shallow Grave. Uh, it, it is the... There's only been two books, right, written on this? Yes, yes. And this is the latest one. The other one's written a long, long time Very ago. Long, right. Well, shortly after the, uh, the killings. Yeah, yeah. Now... Um, People who, well, I think it's interesting on this story because after I had you on, I have had more people come up to me and talk to me about this case and that interview that we did. And that's why I want because for a different audience uh, than, than what you, we had in the past. Let's talk about the fact that you started out of the Standard Times and you really wrote the first story on this, right? In the newspaper or one of the first anyway? Well, one of the first. Uh, the stories that I did in um, October of... Uh, 1988. Really, a lot of attention. There wasn't a lot of attention to the case prior to that. For good reason, because uh, no one really knew all, all these women missing. Mm -hmm. uh, the extent of the case really wasn't clear until September of 1988. And you, and your, your original story was on missing women. Yeah, the missing missing women. Um, by that. October of '88, there were only two, there were two bodies that had been found in, in July, mm -hmm. and it was only uh, thanks to a New Bedford police detective film at one of the suspect's houses uh, that a, a woman was being choked on um, on camera, and so they they pers uh, the investigators looked down that avenue, uh, went to checked with some indep independent video makers uh that's, that's a euphemism right? <laughs> <laughs> and um looked through all of their tapes and went to all of the all the video stores around here that had the uh, x-rated uh films mm -hmm. and now of course video stores don't even exist no. anymore but at that time for those who aren't familiar with what was a video store you used to go to a store uh, and you could rent films. Right. And the X-rated or adult films were behind a curtain very often or in a separate room. And okay, you right. had to be 18 or 21 to get back there. And the police went from place to place, uh, particularly some of the mom and pop uh, businesses, and grabbed all of their, their videos and had to view them all to hoping to find this snuff film. Right. And they never did find it. And if it even existed, even if it existed, yeah. right? The um, and, and some of these films, from what I understand, were really they were not erotic that they had to watch. They said they were really, really badly done, and they were grainy, and they were just absolutely horrible. You you <laughs> have boring. Uh, you there's a um, of course one of the main parts of this book, you know, one of the main police officers, of course, is Josie Gonzalez and his partner, Maureen Dill. Marianne Dill. Marianne, I'm sorry. I'm looking at, yeah, yeah. I'm looking at Maureen, got, that's why I said. But at least you got Josie's name right. I don't know, outside of this area, it is, I have corrected so many people on the air when they have mispronounced Josie's first and last name. And it was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm a Freetown kid. I know. Yeah, you know. I knew him my whole life. Yeah. Uh, he, He's the nicest guy in the world. Tremendous uh, guy. He, um, he, of course, has a scene where he has to, he's sitting home watching some of these, mm -hmm. these, these hideously poorly made uh, pornographic movies at his house when the kids are asleep. Up yeah. and he, I, I just kind of laughed at that because I know his kids. Uh, but he and his partner... And, and also, you know that Josie is a very, very um, honorable, very religious man, very much a family man, and it is... <laughs> yeah, you, you can't imagine him having to sit through, um, you know, hours and hours. No, of right. Film. No, I, I know. <laughs> but it's the way you've written the story. It, you, you know, if you know him, particularly, kind of funny. You yes. know, in a sense. Yeah. It, 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 because uh, that is so out of character. For yeah. Him to be in, in what is it. in what is a very obviously sad story, there are some kind of you know obviously you have to have a light moment or two. But with uh, he and his partner, they really worked this case, right? Yes, they did, along with many others. Um, of course. Yeah. 
Um, and of course, but you know, you can't focus on everyone, and uh, and that right. is not to slight any of the other investigators in there who worked very very hard, uh, but they were the primary uh, two investigators in the case, and they did work at unbelievable hours. Yeah, you get some interesting stories of them driving around the the drug and prostitution areas of the mm-hmm. city and people running and then realizing, oh, it's just those two and yes. coming back. <laughs> yeah. uh, because they like them. They're just really, really nice, and uh, they knew that they really wanted to, to solve the case. The main, the only person ever charged was Ken Pond. Yes. Right? Yep. And that case ultimately fell apart. Yes. Yep. Much yeah, like well, Ken Pond's life. Yeah. Uh, some would argue that, it, that his life had fallen apart way before that. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. He talk a little bit about Ken Pond, what, what, how he got wrapped into this thing. Uh, Ken Pond had been uh, had a, a heroin problem in his uh, early in his life, and he, re- for all appearances, he had recovered. Uh, he was in recovery. He went to uh, finish college, went to law school. Uh, so he would have been considered a success story, a mm-hmm. recovery success story. Um, unfortunately, drug addiction is, uh, it's a very, very difficult for people to shake. Right. Um, and during the eighties, uh, in this area, uh, cocaine, uh, came in very, very hard. Some people believe that Coke was quote unquote non-addictive, right. uh, which was the biggest lie ever. Uh, but it did really, uh, grab a lot of people. Um, in the community, people who were very prominent also, uh, people who had very good jobs um, were, were using uh, Coke at that time. Uh, but not all of them became cocaine addicts. Right. Um, but they did, they, they partied a lot, and eventually, but they stopped. Mm-hmm. Um, it caught him uh, and dragged him down. Um, and obviously, it, it's pretty clear that he didn't want people to know that he was using again, mm-hmm. uh, this time Coke, because he was a lawyer. Um, right. He had a lot to lose. Uh, and I'm sure he he may have been worried that he was really going to disappoint his family. I don't know. Um, but but he did not want to lose his, his standing in the bar. And so he was using these women to using, go get drugs for him, right? Yeah, they would, they'd buy, buy the, get the, he'd give them money, get the drugs for him, and they'd go to his house and they'd party. And right. the, the women didn't, didn't care because, one, he wasn't having sex with them. Right. Uh, what he would do is share his drugs with them. Right. Um, but he would lock them in the house uh, because he didn't want anyone else coming in. And then he'd get very, very paranoid. Mm-hmm. And, uh, there's a lot of stories in the book about how how weird things had gotten. And, yeah. And obviously... There's some weird stories in that book. Yes, about yes, yes. And uh, the, gr- the girls uh, were told investigators some very strange stories, and there was a consistency in the stories. You'll have to get the book, folks, to, to learn what those stories are. Yes. You'll have to get the books. <laughs> yeah. uh, well... So in, in one, one hand, he was very, very... He was a very sad, but yes. very weird character. Yeah, he... Um, and of course, he's, he's passed away now. We'll take a quick break. We're speaking with Maureen Boyle, uh, who's written the book Shallow Graves about the uh, Greater New Bedford Highway serial killer. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back.
And good afternoon. I'm Chris McCarthy filling in for Barry. Barry's enjoying the day off. Uh, we have in studio with us Maureen Boyle. We're discussing her book, Shallow Graves, which is about the New Bedford Highway serial killer. Um, we talked about some of the police officers. I find these the, those folks fascinating who did this investigation. Uh, Richie Ferreira, talk a little bit about his role. Uh, Richie Ferreira worked very closely with Marianne uh, Dill and Josie Gonzalez. He was a New Bedford uh, detective at the time. Uh, what was very common and still is the practice today, whenever there's homicides, uh, often a local detective will be paired off with the state trooper who's okay. assigned to the DA's office, and they work together. Uh, so Richie uh, worked property crimes uh, and check and fraud cases at that time. And as a result, he knew a lot of the girls on the street because addicts at that time, as in today, but maybe a little bit less so because a lot of people don't write checks, um, they would write bad checks oh, sure. to get money or shoplift or things like that. So he was familiar with a lot of the girls on the street and he has a very lovely way about him um, to get people to talk. Um, he's a very friendly, open, just happy person. Um, and people just gravitate towards him. Uh, so his um, interviewing techniques are, are very, very good. Okay. And the girls liked him. All right. You know, not liked him, liked him, but they, you know, they, they found him uh, almost like a father figure. Okay. And uh, so he worked very closely with Marianne and Josie as they're interviewing uh, the girls and interviewing po uh, potential witnesses and going to scenes and just tracking down general information. And these folks worked really long hours. Yes, yes, they, they really did because... They'd spend the mornings uh, often uh, going to court uh, or going through records or following up on leads. And then they'd be out at night tracking down additional witnesses who were now awake and right. out and about. Uh, one of the reasons why they'd be going to court is some of the witnesses had, had court dates. Sure. Or during the day, they would go to uh, the jails and the prisons where potential witnesses might be. It, it, yeah, because you think about it, the, the people who are generally part of this world don't have the most normal schedules. Exactly. They're up running around at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Yes. So the police have to be out there at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. If they're looking for people. Because they're sleeping. And, and if, they're, um, if they're not out, they may be locked up. And to get access, uh, easy access, uh, they have to be uh, at, the, at the prisons mm -hmm. or at the court during the administrative hours and right. that's daytime right no it's it, and, and it was very it's very and you do an excellent job explaining how this these how this affected these police officers lives i mean they just became consumed with this case and and it was very difficult for all the police officers uh who had families mm -hmm. because it was taking them away from you know their their sons and their daughters uh games uh school performances, family outings, you know, they get home and they're tired. They're right. beyond tired. Right. Um, so that, that their, um, their significant others and their, their uh, spouses were really taking up the lion's share of, on the family end, getting things, uh, keeping things normal. We're going to take a, a, a phone call? We'll yes, take a, we'll take a phone call. wonderful. Yeah. Hey, thanks for holding your live on the air with Maureen Boyle. Yeah, Hi. Uh, I ran out and bought the book after Maureen was on your show in September. Uh, I found it very interesting. I grew up in New Bedford in the North End, and I think to Maureen's point earlier on that these aren't like cardboard cutouts, uh, Nancy Piva actually grew up right around the corner from me in the North End of New Bedford, and Kenny Pont actually went to school with me at uh, Normandon Junior High School at the time. And to her point, I mean, these were basically regular, decent kids. And the only thing I found in common when I read the book and after the fact, you know, we parted ways and I got drafted and I went away. But it seemed like every one of them got caught up in the drug trade or the drug stuff. And it seems like that's what derailed every one of them. I did find it fascinating, though, about in the book, which I didn't know when you mentioned a couple of times of what used to go on behind closed doors at Kenny Pont's house. <laughs> I was kind of uh, amazed at that. 
Yes. I appreciate you, you phrasing it that yeah. way. Um, yeah. Sickened, too, maybe, but, but it's just it's, very strange. Yeah, very, very you gotta strange. you got to buy the book, folks, to, to learn yeah. this, uh, w- what was going on. But you're right, Maureen. I mean, very closed area, small area. These people were basically normal people, right? It, exactly. Um, and unfortunately, today, uh, opiate addiction has uh, spread throughout the state and throughout the country. So uh, more and more people are seeing the, uh, the devastation of, of heroin. And that, the, the caller's right, though. I mean, that is basically the common thread was that yes. they got caught up in the drug world. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, just the devastation. We'll go back to the phones. Thanks for holding your live on WBSM. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, I wanted to comment on the book because I, I heard that uh, Kenny Pont was only addicted to crack, I mean, or cocaine or whatever. I know Kenny Pont since I was young, and uh, he was a heroin addict. He was on the methadone program for not then, and they didn't mention that. And uh, I didn't read the book, but I heard last time she was on, and uh, and I knew him. I knew him very good. Yeah, uh, saying, yeah. When uh, he was he when he was with all the people that got killed or whatever, because they used to go to his house and get high with him. But he was a, he was a heroin addict. He was not a cocaine. No, he, he was he was later uh, addicted to cocaine. Early on, you're correct. He was a, a heroin addict, and he beat his heroin addiction, or at least it appeared that he did. Uh, but then later on, he was uh, he was he- very very heavy into uh, cocaine. And it, and you you cover all his history yes. in, in the book. Yes. You, you explain. I think you got a pardon, right, or a, or a commutation something. To yeah, allow him to become to, a lawyer, because yeah, yeah, he had some it. criminal stuff when he was a heroin yeah. addict as a young guy. Yeah, and uh, that was all cleared so he could become a lawyer. Yeah, yeah, no, that's all covered in the book, folks. Um, well, we're gonna take uh, we'll take another call, boy. We're bringing him in today. Thanks for holding your live, WBSM. Did you ever get to interview Paul Riley and Neil Landis? Paul Riley's dead. Yeah, so nobody ever got to interview. Yeah, he's dead. Uh, but the law enforcement... Now, Neil had... Anderson is incarcerated for a, a bank robbery he, that he did on a bicycle. Uh, did you ever get a chance to try to speak to him? Neil yeah, Anderson? No, no we, we, we didn't go, get into uh, deep into into him uh, in the book. He was, an, he was a suspect at that time. Um, and he well, was... He was a body dumper, so I don't know why you wouldn't want to talk to him. What do you mean a body dumper? He was he was never charged with murder, sir. Uh, he was, what, he, what he was, he uh, was charged with... He was with... never charged. He was arrested for it. No, 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 sir. He was, he was never... He was, held, he, he was held on beating up a prostitute yes. and leaving it supposedly dead. Uh, he he was arrested on a series of of charges of Thanks for the call. Of, atta- of attacking of attacking women, okay. um, and he was convicted and went to prison for that. And then when he came out, uh, he he was rearrested for robbing a bank, on and a bike. he's still still locked up. But he was you know obviously they looked at him uh, in the case, mm-hmm. uh, and they looked at a number of. Uh, men in the case, and right. not just uh, he. Be- his name became uh, prominent primarily because it emerged very, very quickly. Okay. Uh, the attack, his uh, his arrest. He was one of the first to be arrested. There were numerous suspects in 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 this uh, case. Talk about um, Tony DeGrazio. Uh, Tony DeGrazio was um, in his twenties. He's from the Freetown Lakeville area. He was arrested uh, pro- much years prior to this, uh, to the killings uh, on two separate rape cases, but he was later acquitted. Uh, he came into the spotlight of uh, both the media and law enforcement. Uh, when some of the girls ident- uh, were talking about a uh, individual who had a boxer-like nose, okay. just in a face like a boxer, um, you know, someone who's going one too many rounds, and you know, yeah. we, we all know what what that looks sure, like. Sure, smashed in nose. Yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, they said that he had 
uh, assaulted them, that he choked them nearly unconscious. Uh, in some cases, that, that they were unconscious. Uh, some of the girls, you know, fought back, uh, ran off. Uh, he was arrested for one series of uh, attacks on multiple women, mm-hmm. uh, and then eventually made bail, and then was uh, arrested again uh, subsequently uh, about a, a year or two after that. He was uh, looked at as a suspect in the case, but however, he was never charged. Mm-hmm. He... You have a very, again, to talk about how close this was, of course, he was living right down the street from where I grew up, uh, at staying at my church, St. John Newman yeah. Church, which was also Josie Gonzalez's yes. church, and Father Harrison was our parish priest, and ta- he is staying at the house, and the police come, right? Yeah, he was briefly staying at the rectory, um, and one of the reasons why he was staying at the rectory was that he was forced to move out of the cottage he was living in because he lost his job and uh, be- because of his arrest and mm-hmm. he didn't have any money and he really begged the priest if he could stay there briefly um and he kept on bugging the priest that's a father uh harrison said you know he kept on asking and 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 then asked some more mm-hmm. um, until he finally said yes, but it, it had, had to be temporary. Right. So he let him stay in the guest quarters there, and um, police went there to arrest him on a, on one of the on a series of rapes. And he, he and he bolted. He bolted. He escaped, yeah. and he was later found dead. He killed himself. Um, that, uh, much later. Much, much later. later. Okay. Much All later. right. At, 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 at that time, uh, he later turned himself in. That's right. uh, on that, on that, uh, those that rape case. He, um, a lot of people think that he he may have been the the person. He was never charged. And never you know, right. Let's and be clear and, about and you know what? There, there may be some people who say that, and I've said this to many many people, especially those who say, "Well, who do you think did it?" Um, and I, I honestly say I don't know. If the police and um, the district attorney's office can't publicly say who they believe uh, the killer is Mm -hmm. or if they don't know Mm -hmm. it's not up to me to 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 say uh could he have been the killer i mean he's got he has family around here right and it's really and a fairly large family and it's really not fair to them for anyone to be maligning him uh now that he's dead uh but he he was a central figure in the case um dead or alive and it's important that people uh, know more about about what led police uh, to him. In, in, in to, to your point, uh, I know people that knew him, and they say there is no way he could have done it. Yeah. You know, I've heard people who really knew him say yeah. there is absolutely no way he could have done this. So just to you know, just to keep keep it, uh, yeah. just because some people feel one way, some people feel the other way, and as you point out, really, particularly when someone's dead, they can't defend themselves. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. And, uh, and and for their family, it's not right. uh, it's not fair. And, you know, especially around here, everyone knows everyone and everyone has uh, <laughs> uh, ties uh, and opinions, uh, some right, some wrong. Sure. Uh, but it's, you know, his family had nothing to do with uh, any of his actions. Mm-hmm. That's something that neither him, his family or even Kenny Pond's family. So right. we have to keep that in mind. Very, very excellent, excellent point. We're speaking with Maureen Boyle, who's written the book Shallow Graves, which is about the New Bedford Highway uh, killings, uh, serial killings. Now, there there were other suspects all all, uh, all over the place, right? There yes. were there were people. It's amazing to me, and I have talked with like you have. I've talked with people who investigated this case off the record, and they have said to me it was amazing how many people's names started to turn up. People you knew. People who were well respected in the community, and what are they doing with these prostitutes? And and, and what, what, this whole sort of secret world. Yeah, I, and, and that's what I was amazed at. You know, I thought that I knew a lot about the case uh, going into the book, um, but then I d- discovered there was a lot more uh, out there, uh, and police did look at such a wide range of uh, of individuals, uh, people who picked up prostitutes. 
uh, people who were using drugs that no one knew about. Mm-hmm. Um, we're talking about people who were business business leaders, uh, doctors, lawyers, members of law enforcement, or tied to law enforcement, government officials, um, people involved in courts, you name it. Um, it fishermen, people who worked in factories. I mean, it goes across all lines. And there were some, I, I think that's, that's what really stunned some of the investigators when they were, when some of the names were coming up and they're thinking, you know, who are they crazy? Because in 1988, it was, um, AIDS was right. in the headlines right. and that was in 88, many people who, uh, contracted the AIDS virus died. Yes. Um, and it was, uh, they were still experimenting with the cocktails, uh, drug cocktails, uh, to stop or slow down the virus. Um, and it was all tied to intravenous drug use. So uh, everyone is thinking, you know, are these people crazy to be? Well, you have a scene, to- you have a scene in the book where Bob St. Jean, who's a state police officer assigned to the district attorney's office, gets a phone call from someone prominent in the community who's concerned his name may be become yeah. public and he's worried and, and Bob St. Jean is, wants to say to the guy, well, what are you doing in, involved with this? Yeah. This should be the least of your concerns whether your it, name's going to become exactly, public. Exactly, exactly. The book is so good, folks, because you're going to recognize people's names. You're going to remember, even though you think you may know the case and you because you grew up in it, you're going to remember things and learn things you never knew before yeah. in this book. It's really, really spectacular. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back.
but that doesn't mean. Hey, good afternoon. We're back here live with Maureen Boyle, uh, who's written the book Shallow Graves about the New Bedford Highway killing. Um, and uh, it's just a fascinating book, folks. We're going to go right back to the phones. Thanks for holding your live in WBSM. Thanks for taking my call. Thanks for coming on, Maureen. Oh, Maureen, um, in between the fifth and sixth body being found, do you remember the, the name Don Cook Copley? She was found yes, I do. And at Fort Rodman? Yep. Yes, come, I do. To any knowledge, did you know, how come her name was never thrown into that? Um, well, she, they did look at, uh, at her death, uh, the death of, uh, and the death of two, uh, two to three other women to see if it was linked to the case. Uh, but they, they didn't r completely rule it out, uh, but they do not believe that uh, Don Copeland... But the manner of death and the different things... Yeah, there's there's a, there's there's a, there's a few different. things that were slightly different. Um, but, you know, as, as uh, Josie Gonzalez had, has always said, you know, don't have tunnel vision on things. Um, but they did not believe at that time that uh, Don Copeland was tied into that series of, of, of uh, killings. Yeah, because I, I, I was from this area. I, I moved up to Taunton for a while, and I found out about her on the, when the Boston Herald, sitting down getting ready to go to work and having breakfast. Yeah. And it was, it was, I remember toward the end of it, after the last, because you obviously have the two bodies that are missing, but people, a few other people locally were trying to bring that in, and I guess it was looked at, so. Yeah, um, there was there was a, a couple uh, there was a, a couple of other earlier murders also that they were looking at and uh, that that she was last seen leaving a bar, and that was part of a series of murders where women were last seen uh, leaving bars. I believe there was yeah. two other two other women that were last seen leaving bars and then they were uh, later found dead. Okay, thank you very much for okay. taking my call. Thanks, thank you for thank you for the calling us, uh, Maureen. What what was interesting reading the book is you don't is you don't is you realize that it really it, it happened so a very short period of time right they yes. believe those killings and they and then they just stopped and you know what what's interesting the killings the last known disappearance uh, was in September of eighty eight and the first story on the bodies you know. Uh, searching for information about the bodies and linking all of the disappearances. Um, the, the story first linking all the disappearances was in uh, October of 88, shortly after the the last person was reported missing. That mm -hmm. was Dawn Mendes. And then after that, there was nothing that we know of. No other women went missing, which was, was odd. It was a very short period of period, time. Yeah, from... Um, Roughly March of 88 to September of 88. They, um, now, of course, it, and, and folks really pick the book up because we can't do it justice here on the radio. We're, we're trying to give you, a, you know, bits and pieces of it. Ron Peen is a district attorney at the time. He ultimately loses to Paul Walsh, mm -hmm. who comes in. Paul is handed the case, and he makes a decision that, because there's a case pending here for Ken Pond, right? Ken, yes. Ken Pond's yes. been charged. Yeah, the clock is ticking. Um, they have to, uh, under mass law, they have to try, with some exceptions, uh, try them within a year. And, I mean, there, there's a lot of exceptions that it can be extended. Mm -hmm. But, the, but the, the trial clock is ticking. So he brings in a special prosecutor. And the special prosecutor it said he had full intention, intention to uh, prosecute the case, but he had to look at what the evidence was. Mm -hmm. He wound up looking at boxes and boxes and Buckley, boxes. right? That was yeah. his name? Buckley, Paul Buckley. And they ultimately decided to drop the case. Yes, he, he, looked, at, he looked at the case and uh, could not uh, bring it to trial. He said there was not any evidence to, to even bring it to trial. And the, there's another scene in the book that you, you mentioned that Josie Gonzalez and his partner, uh, Miss, Miss uh, Mary Ann Dill, she, they tell one of the missing, one of the now found but dead women's relatives that they'll, if they're in the court the day the suspect is arraigned, if they're not, they, well, explain what, what yeah, they said. If, um, it is very, very common when a, a suspect is, is arraigned, 
particularly in a high profile case. Um, the investigators who worked so hard on it, they are always, nearly always in the courtroom to watch the person being arraigned. It, it's just a, a tradition. Okay. Um, and they had told um, Nancy Piper's sister that if you see us in the courtroom, you know this is the one we believe did it. And when Kenny Pomp was arraigned, they were not there. Right. I find that to be very, 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 very interesting uh, part of the book. Now, you've got all kinds of characters in the book. Kevin Reddington, who's a very famous lawyer now, he represented Ken Pont at the time. He was not a famous lawyer. No. A very good lawyer, but he was not, uh, he did not have the high profile uh, clients that he does uh, today. And uh, I tell you, when he stepped in the courtroom back then, um, no one knew what hit him uh, right. because he is very, very focused, uh, laser focused in the courtroom. I have heard people who have seen him. I've never seen him uh, uh, operate, but they people say it's unbelievable to watch he, him operate. He is uh, very much a gentleman in the courtroom. He knows the law. He is not. Um, he is, is very polite in the courtroom. Um He's not nasty. He is not one of those, you know, isn't it true, blah, blah, blah type right. of lawyers that you might see on, on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, he, a gentleman is the best way to describe it, and he does know the law. Yes, I've, I understand it's not fun to be cross-examined by uh, him, particularly if you're yeah. a member of law enforcement. He might be nice, but he knows the rules and knows he, the— oh, Yes, he definitely does, and he, um, and, the police, and he likes the cops that he's— <laughs> that he's uh, cross-examining, too. What, what I found interesting is it's clear from reading your book anyway, he didn't think that Ken Pont did it either because he stayed friendly with him afterwards. Well, uh, he well, I wouldn't say he stayed friendly with him. He took his phone calls. You know, he, he wasn't taking him uh, home for dinner or anything like that. But, uh, you know, uh, Kevin Reddington is, as I said, a gentleman and will be uh, very, um, very kind to his clients. Uh, so, yeah, he did stay in touch with him because Ken would call him, and uh, and he would take his call. Right, right. We're speaking with Maureen Boyle. We'll take another quick break. We'll be right back.
did, it, did they get them? Yeah. And good afternoon. We're back. We're going to go right back to the phones. Thanks for holding your live with Maureen Boyle. I'm sorry. I have the wrong number. Oh, okay. Well, have a nice day. Um, I've never had that happen before, Maureen. <laughs> Um, well, so the name of the book is Shallow Graves. Folks, I can, I can tell you that you, you love the book. It's got a great – well, Tim White, who's a regular here on the program with us, he endorses the book. He's got a nice blurb on the back of there as well from Channel 12. Uh, I can tell you I've read it twice. Everyone I have shared the book with has been fascinated and has loved it. I think you've really done a, done a masterpiece here, not only telling an important story but also really putting life into the victims and, and explaining that, that they were a lot more than just a – a statistic. Oh, thank you so much for saying that because that was the aim of the book um, to tell the story of the victims, tell the story of the investigators, um, and to show what New, Bed the New Bedford's strengths also um, are in this uh, then and now. You, you, you have a, a nice scene at the end uh, at the Portuguese feast. Yes. A nice upbeat. And the, the, in yes. some ways, we've, the, the drug culture that, that was gone for a while, I think, is back. I know it's back. Um, I don't, we haven't seen any killings like this though. Thank God. Yep. That's, um, so if, if the killer is still out there, he, he may have just moved on or he's dead or, or he's dead. locked up or he's locked up because something stopped them and they yes. generally don't stop right until they get caught. Oh, but so, sometimes they will stop for a couple of years. That okay. it has happened in cases for whatever reason. It's, it's a fascinating case. And I tell you, you, you folks. If you think you know the case, you don't. You have to read the book. You're going to learn things, and you're going to remember things. And I talked to people who, who were police officers at the time, and they go, wow, I've forgotten about that. Or, yeah. you know, so it's great. Well, Maureen, thank you so much for joining us. And again, folks, it's, it's Shallow Graves. You can get it on Amazon. You can get any of the local bookstores. And are you doing any appearances? Um, yes, I am. I am. Um, uh, it's list, most of the appearances are listed on the Facebook page okay. of the book, Shallow Graves, uh -huh. The Hunt for the New Bedford Highway Serial Killer, my author page, Maureen Boyle. Uh, the, there's, uh, the website is uh, shallowgravesthebook.com. Um, and I'm very active on tw uh, Twitter, Maureen E. Boyle 1. Thank you so much, Maureen. Have a great day.